Hello everybody, and welcome back to Mystery Disappearance. Today we conclude our theories over the disappearance of Joshua Gimon. If you've watched my other videos, you've seen that the theories really go in many different directions. Everything surrounding this case looks suspicious. Any investigations, whether by law enforcement or civilians who take an interest in this case, end up going in circles. I've released these videos because I myself took an interest in this case, even though I'm in no position to do any real investigation, I don't live in Minnesota, but the real purpose of these videos was to keep the story of Josh Gimo alive. This young man disappeared without a trace and doesn't deserve to be forgotten, even better if we can learn the truth one day. But before we head into the conclusion of this miniseries, we're going to take a look at some final theories, tie up some loose ends before we finish this thing. Now, I'm not gonna go into great detail in these. These theories are either not as believed anymore, or they just open the door to even more speculation than what I've already done. So, without further delay, let's get into it. On the Simply Vanish podcast, Mr. Josh Newville interviewed a few individuals with somewhat similar stories. They were approached by some large vehicle, such as a four-door pickup truck or SUV, usually late at night, with at least three or four men in the vehicle. Some were approached with an apparent emergency, asking the lone pedestrian for help, inviting them inside their vehicle and then driving to a secluded location. Then some form of attempted sexual assault occurred, or sometimes murder, like in the Chris Jenkins case. One of these strange occurrences happened two weeks after Josh's disappearance. Because of the disappearance, many students were afraid to go out for the next few weeks. But one individual did go out a couple of weeks after, and found himself walking alone at night with a few beers inside him. And he was approached by one of these strange vehicles. Another guy admitted to being approached in a similar manner. They started asking him questions, but he got spooked and started running away as they chased him. He was able to get away. A couple of individuals have stated that the suspicious men were in their 20s. Another individual has had a similar incident and stated that the men were burly men in their 40s. So what's going on here? Is this some form of early 2000s trend of men banding together to lure men inside their vehicles or flat out abduct them to commit these late night sexual assaults and or murders? Obviously, the internet gave a way for like-minded individuals to chat up and meet, so it makes you wonder if Josh was a victim of such a group. Could Josh have been approached that night on his way back to his dorm? Miss Olga Zentino has stated that Josh was a very confident young man, and if a car slowed down by him on the road and people claiming they need some form of help, she believes that Josh would have confidently gone into the vehicle, not being afraid of anything or sensing any danger. Some men don't seem to think they can ever be victim of anything, which is why sometimes some of them walk home from the bar, alone and intoxicated. Did this general mindset make it easy for some malintentioned individuals to prey on young men coming out of bars? Obviously, if Josh was approached by a vehicle of randoms, this is difficult to investigate since they probably just passed by Josh briefly, could have convinced him to enter the vehicle, then they vanish into the night with no evidence whatsoever. It's very possible and a very creepy thought. Possibly tying a little bit into the last theory I just mentioned, it was speculated early on over the possibility of a serial type killer who was targeting college age males around this time. There seemed to be a lot of deaths of young men in bodies of water around this period, over 40 in 3 or 4 different states, and this from the late 1990s to early to mid 2000s. The theory goes like this. A group of individuals abduct drunk young men who come out of bars or parties, then ultimately dump their victims' bodies in the water, possibly alive at the time. Many of these deaths were ruled a suicide or accidental death, especially if no bruises or no evidence of a struggle are found. Then, there always seems to be some smiley face nearby, a graffiti painted on concrete or something. This combination of mysterious deaths gave birth to a smiley face killer theory. It was wondered if Josh could have been the victim of such a killer or group of killers. It was wondered about Chris Jenkins as well. Although I don't believe that any smiley faces were anywhere near Chris Jenkins' body, and Josh's body was never found. Whether such a group of killers exists or not raises debate to this day. Some people still believe in the theory, while others dismiss it as pure nonsense. 
Today we all know about emoticons and use it in our everyday chats and texting, but even back in 2002, the smiley face had already taken the world by storm, made up of basic punctuation that people usually put at the end of their sentences. So finding these basic smileys everywhere as graffiti was nothing unusual. It is the simplest graffiti to make after all, very simple and quickly done in no time, and they were found everywhere. Now, if you sadly find deceased bodies in rivers and lakes, what do you usually find close to rivers and lakes? Normally bridges or overpasses, right? And bridges usually have concrete foundation with pillars and a lot of space for people to draw graffiti. There always seem to be drawings and smiley faces and all sorts of graffiti on those. So it is hard to link one of those smiley faces to a dead body nearby, though it's not completely impossible. Another thing was, if there were smiley face killers, you'd think the smiley face would have some sort of signature, a certain consistent look. But the smileys found were all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors, they didn't really have a consistent look from one another. Yet, if you look online, you can find individuals, on podcasts or whatever, who claim to have been abducted by people claiming to be part of the smiley face killers, and they somehow escaped. So you gotta wonder if they really were victims of the smiley face killers, or people who just say they're part of the smiley face killer. Did people create the legend, or did the legend create people? Did such a group actually exist? If Josh was the victim of a so-called smiley face killer, then why hasn't his body been found? This wouldn't fit their pattern. But what if Josh resisted or fought back, and they felt that their only option was to shoot him? In that case, they couldn't dump the body in a lake because a gun wound would reveal too much information. All of this is speculation on my behalf. Many working in law enforcement seem to doubt or dismiss the theory of the smiley face killer. There was no concrete evidence to link the 40 plus deaths, although the death of so many youths in bodies of water was strange. But it would seem that the smiley face killer is nothing more than an urban legend at this point. On the episode of Unsolved Mysteries, Stearns County Sheriff's Department revealed that an orange Pontiac Sunfire had been intercepted twice by the St. John University Life and Safety in and around the time Josh disappeared. This vehicle seemed to be driving around the campus a few times. On one occasion, Life and Safety stopped the vehicle, and a young college-age male ran out of the car and disappeared before Life and Safety could intercept them. On another account, Life and Safety stopped the vehicle and questioned the driver as he had a college-age student in the passenger seat. He stated that he was dropping him on campus. My first impression was this was just a local gay man cruising around at night for hookups. Okay, maybe that's a little creepy on its own, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's an abductor or killer. This surprisingly happens a lot, gay men living in the shadows. The student who ran away might possibly have been a closeted young gay man who was afraid of getting caught or exposed in this affair. He didn't want to be found out by life and safety or the police, so he possibly panicked and ran out of the car and ran home. Instead of a hookup, it is possible that the car was some drug vendor circulating drugs to and from the campus. What made this theory more bizarre was the fact that by the time Stearns County investigated this area of interest more closely, the car had been crushed. Obviously, authorities must know who the owner of the car is. I assume he's been questioned, and officers found nothing of note. Now, my question is, how long after Josh's disappearance was this car crushed? If it was crushed within weeks or months of Josh disappearing, then I definitely would say this is bizarre. Now, if authorities investigated this 10 years after the fact, and the car was crushed years after Josh's disappearance, then I'm a little less surprised. I don't know what this car has been through. Was it in an accident? Was it totaled? Is that why it was crushed? It's not completely impossible that this driver might have come across Josh at some point, either the night of his disappearance or before. The identity of the driver hasn't been revealed, though it's been confirmed that he isn't connected to any of the pictures of the various men found on Josh's computer. So this is another theory that isn't any more or less suspicious than any of the other ones. One of the earlier theories was if Josh had been victim of some sort of satanic cult. South of St. John's University, across the Sega Tegan Lake, there is a chapel called the Stella Maris Chapel. Apparently the chapel had been defaced with various satanic symbols. I didn't find an exact time frame of when these symbols could have been drawn, but the Gimon family wondered if there could have been some connection to Josh. However, both Stearns County Sheriff's Department and St. John's University have stated that this chapel and other ones had been defaced and graffitied before, whether satanic symbols were drawn or swastikas or racial slurs. 
It's a religious college campus, so I can buy that they are victim of hate crimes or graffitis from time to time. There isn't a lot of information on this theory, but authorities didn't take this information seriously, believing that it is difficult to establish a connection between a defaced chapel and the disappearance of a student. I haven't found information on if there was some form of satanic cult in or around campus. Sometimes students form weird cults, whether it's one of those vampire cults or something else. There's no evidence that Josh was ever in contact with such a cult, whether in person or online. Unless you want to associate this theory with the strange events on October 28th, where Josh called an unknown number, had an individual banned from Yahoo Chat, then deleted his account, could Josh have accidentally come in contact with some obscure cult? But regardless, the satanic cult theory hasn't been explored much. I think I've touched on most of the theories concerning Josh's disappearance. As time goes on, it seems as though more theories come out and endless speculation. But now it's your turn to voice your opinions. Obviously none of us knows for sure what happened to Josh, but based on all the information that's out there, what do you think happened to Joshua Gimo? Did Josh jump or fell in one of the nearby lakes of the campus, and for whatever reason his body has never surfaced and wasn't found by competent drivers or the best technological devices? Did Josh accidentally die at the card party from an overdose or whatever, and the other students decided to cover it up? Or some type of premeditated plan was made by the group to get rid of Josh for some unknown reason? Are ex-girlfriend Katie Benson and or best friend Nick Hajikovic responsible for getting rid of Josh, either because of a blossoming romance or for some other unknown reason? Could one or a few of the monks on campus be responsible for the disappearance, either because of some accident that they decided to cover up or to silence this student who was voicing his concern and wanted to write a paper on the monks' abuse scandal? Could Josh himself have been victim of some form of sexual advance and threatened his abuser? Did Josh's online exploration land him in an unsafe situation, by crossing some undesirable online who somehow got enough information to find Josh and cause harm to him? Or was it a mere hookup gone wrong? Could Josh have disappeared by his own decision, or could he have been abducted by a group of people and forced into some illegal underground operation? Could Josh still be alive today, or was at least alive for some time after his disappearance? Could a group of rough rousing or sexual deviant men have forced Josh into their vehicle, or somehow convinced him to enter the vehicle and something happened? Is there a killer or killers who named themselves the smiley face killer who abducted Josh, but never dumped his body in the water which wouldn't fit their normal pattern? Was a driver of an orange Pontiac Sunfire whose strange late night cruisings caught the attention of campus security a couple of times? Or was there some bizarre cult near the university who, randomly or not, chose Josh as their victim? Let me know in the comments what you believe might have happened. Do you think one of my theories is right, or do you have another theory that I haven't covered? If there are details that I've missed, feel free to comment to any of these videos. I'm still finding tidbits even now as I'm wrapping up these videos. And if you were around Joshua Gimon around that time and have information that you never shared, please talk. Even if you have to send some anonymous letter to somebody. My heart goes out to Josh's friends, but my heart especially goes out to Brian Gimo and Lisa Cheney, Josh's parents, and to the rest of his family. This is a tragedy and whoever is responsible shouldn't get away with this. What about myself? What theory do I believe the most? Well, that's a difficult question for me to answer. My brain goes to different theories at different times. When I think about the monks at the school, I think their behavior is a very likely possibility. When I think about Josh's online behavior, I think there are a lot of possibilities there as well. Even the students at the card party, even though some of the theories get more complex, it could be something as simple as Josh overdosing on some sort of drug, then the attendees at the party decided to cover it up and efficiently got rid of the body. Although that is a bit of a quick overdose, but depending on what drug and what quantity of it, you also wonder if one theory bleeds into another. For example, was Nick contacted by someone from the party that night, and Nick made his way to the party to decide what to do about the situation with Josh? Was that why his timing differed from Katie's recollection? I think it's pretty gruesome if the kids at the party and Nick did that, got rid of the body then kept silent about it. You'd think at least one of them would crack from the guilt. There's no way Nick could have fallen asleep that night either, and he had engagements the next day, but we just don't know for sure. Today, Josh would most likely be a successful lawyer with his own firm, or maybe a senator, or maybe even president. Gosh, what could have been.
I hope someday I can make one final video on Joshua Gimon, the video where we finally have the answers. Until then everybody, keep your eyes open and keep Josh's stories alive.